Come, beloved of God, laying aside the hard and harsh ways of the world. Come, beloved of God, to practice the patient and kind ways of love. Come, beloved of God, to trust that love that holds fast in all things, hearts soft and minds open, we come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You. you may be seated. All right, so I'm going to move up here for my theme time this morning. And I wasn't sure, I don't know, so Caitlin and Jordan... Do you guys want to come up and give me a hand with this piece? I wasn't sure if I'd have any helpers, but this is great if you're able to come and do that. How are you this morning? Good. Good, Good to see you guys. All right, so I have a bunch of items on this table up here. And I bet you probably can guess what we might do with these things. What would you do with these things? Yeah, I've got all the stuff for planting. And this is just stuff I grabbed from my home that I kind of had in my garage. So it's all stuff I've used before. I got my little pot here. Um, These are the seeds that we have for people that want to take some today or they'll be planted here. And I also have some seeds in here. Do you have any idea what kind of seeds those are? Do you recognize Do you know anything about seeds? No? Sometimes, have you ever eaten like green beans, right, and you open them up inside? These are bean seeds, and so that's actually what you find inside green or yellow beans. And I think this is a whole variety, right? They all look different, so I'm not sure even what kind of beans they are. We'd have to plant them and see what comes up and what grows on them to know what they are. Um, But yeah, I have some soil. I also brought some of my fertilizer from home, right? This I use this on my house plants once in a while, but you can use this on vegetables too. Have you guys planted a garden before? A little bit? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Like, I wasn't really sure. I wasn't, do, do, should we plant a bean seed this morning? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Um, we'll see over here. We'll try not to make a mess, but if we do, that's okay. We'll vacuum it up as well. So... I hadn't thought this part through, but what we might do is, how, how this will work best, we need to get some soil into our pot. So maybe do you want to take that and you can scoop it in? Here. Yeah. And try and, we'll try and keep it over this tray here. And if we spill a little bit, that's okay. Does anybody here know how deep are we supposed to plant a bean seed? Who are my gardeners here? An inch, half an inch? How much? Four feet deep? I think that might be a little bit deep because, yeah, they need to be able to spread it. We could put, let's put the soil right to the top here because sometimes, too, it starts to pack down when, um, when the water goes in. Yeah, fill a little bit more here, too. And, Caitlin, why don't you pick out a seed there? When do you think that looks interesting to you. That's perfect. All right, you got a little bit of a, can I see that one? I just want to take a look at it. Okay, kind of a light brown there. Cool. All right. So what we need to do, who's okay? My hands are a little bit dirty. Do you guys want to get your hand dirty? Usually you got to make a little hole. Do you know how d- deep an inch is? About like that. You want me to stick my finger in there? <laughs> All right, I'll make our hole for us. We just drop it in. Yeah, and then cover it over. Um, I wasn't thinking ahead that I don't actually have water in here, so after worship, we'll get some water, and we'll put water on there. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, did you see in the windows around the sanctuary here, Bonnie went, oh, Brad has his water bottle there. Look at that. When there's... <laughs> Oh, you're going to, okay, perfect. 
That's probably good. <laughs> you guys will want to put a little bit of water? Yeah. 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 And yeah, we'll put a little more, and then we'll let Jordan do a little bit here, too. Awesome. What do you think? Do you think that's enough water? I think that's a good start. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for helping me with that. You can go ahead and have a seat. Well, look at that. I wasn't planning to necessarily plant that, but that's great. We got to start on our garden here. Um, I know that we have some gardeners here, and uh, the thing about gardening, right, is there's certain things that we know and certain things that we can control, right? We have to, you know, provide a place for the seeds to be planted, and usually that if it's outside or right, it involves getting our vegetable patch or our garden, the soil prepared, usually adding some kind of um, fertilizer or nutrients, compost maybe, to our garden manure those sorts of things that will give some extra nutrients to the plants as they grow and help them to produce. But those who garden also know that there are a lot of things that are out of our control too when it comes to gardening, um, right? I mean, in these days, if we have access to water, we, we can water our garden if it hasn't rained in a while. But uh, if um, it's raining all the time, I mean, we can't control, we can't make the sun shine when we need it, right? Farmers for sure know that really well, how dependent um, they are, we are on weather to also contribute and make our seeds and plants grow and thrive. Um, our reading that we're having in our worship today, we're following through uh, the letter, Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians. And we're going to hear a passage today that when you read it, when we hear it, gardens and seeds are not the first thing we'll, you would think of. Um, it's a passage that will be really familiar to you, though. It's Paul's famous words about love and what, is, what does love look like, what does it mean to love. And I think, though, it's such a beautiful image um, for us on this day that we're thinking about our Jesus garden and planting seeds. Um, love, I think, is, our seeds are a beautiful image or a metaphor for love, how we plant what we can. Um, some things are beyond our control, right? We kind of can put love, do loving things, put that out into the world, but it's not always up to us, and we can't control the outcomes. And yet... We are called, God calls us to keep planting those seeds of love. So I'm going to invite us to keep this image in mind as we worship today and think about Paul's invitation um, and instruction about what it means to love one another in a community in particular. So I'll invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Loving Lord, you have showered your world with faith, hope, and love. Help us to be faithful to you, to offer hope to those in need, and to love all your children. Amen. As you are able, I invite you to rise in body and in spirit for our scripture song.
You may be seated. May we be equipped by these words to walk in love for God, ourselves, our neighbors, and all people of God's creation. If I speak of tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give away everything that I have and hand over my body to feel good about what I've done, but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As for prophecies, they will be brought to an end. As for tongues, they will stop. As for knowledge, it will be brought to an end. We know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, what is partial will be brought to an end. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child, think like a child. But now that I have become an adult, I've put an end to childish things. Now we see a reflection in the mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know partially, but then I will know completely in the same way that I have been completely known. Now faith, hope, and love remain. These three things, and the greatest of these is love. God's story, our story. Thanks be to God. So I'm pretty sure that this passage is one of the few in Scripture that would be more widely known outside uh, the walls of a church, right? It's one that does show up, um, especially in wedding services. I think we hear it most often. Really, really beautiful words that Paul writes here about love. But he wasn't writing them to a couple uh, getting ready to be married. Not that it can't speak to that situation. But Paul was writing these words about love to a Christian community that was dealing with a lot of infighting that were really, really divided. They had been picking sides and setting up camps. It seems, based on clues also in this letter, um, that they were arguing about spiritual gifts, right? Things like wisdom and prophecy and healing teaching, speaking in tongues. We see Paul make reference to some of those in this passage. Um, And other parts in the letter, he talks in more depth about these, right? They were arguing about which of these gifts is most important, um, not recognizing that they are all needed and that they are all intended for the building up of the community. But instead, people were using them to build up themselves, to build up their own egos, and not for the good of the community. The Corinthians had lost sight of the truth that any and every gift we have comes from God. And the members of of this church that Paul is writing to seem to think they've got it all figured out. Paul is quick to remind them that they most certainly do not. Um, And he says in in this letter, in this passage, right, in this life, they see through a mirror dimly that they can only, in this life, ever know in part. Now, I can't imagine any of us ever being guilty of thinking we have it all figured out. Any of you ever done that? Think that you know the right way, what you know is right or best? Right? I, I know that's not true, and I will be the first to admit that I suffer from this affliction. Um, I'm, I'm working on it. Hopefully we all are. <laughs> um, but it is simply part of, of our human nature, I think, right? to, to feel that our way is, is the best way to see things or do things, that it's the right way. 
Um, and like I said, for some of us, this is a real growing edge, right? For some of us, it's just our, our, our personality, maybe the birthright <laughs> that we've inherited. We really struggle um, to see the possibility that there can be more than one right way to do something. I think also, though, this tendency uh, to have it all figured out or to think our way is, is the, the best way is, is much more innocent um, because we can only know what we know based on our life experiences, right? The experiences that we've had shape how we see the world. And of course, none of us have had the exact same life experiences. Um, it's only, I think, when we try to take what has been our experience and make it try to apply to everyone that we run into problems. And that's when factions and divisions can rise up as well. It certainly happened to this Corinthian church, and it's still happening in our world some 2,000 years later. All right, and I think, at least I, I know I have this feeling, and I know it's shared by a lot of us, that the world in these last um, decades is just moving in a direction where it feels like we're becoming more and more divided and more and more really polarized, right? Like that we're in these two opposing places and it's really hard to find that spot where we can come together. And I think for sure social media and the internet has not helped that, right? Where we can go on um, and say what we think, criticize other people and not have that human connection, right? Things that people say online are things they would never likely say to someone face to face. Um, the challenging thing too that's become a, a, just a fact, especially in more recent years, is right when we go online, there's all these algorithms that are based on things that we've sort of shown that we're interested in or that we like. And so they just keep showing us more of the same. So we're not always exposed uh, in the same way to differences the way we would have been before. So it's, it's a very real problem. It's hard to always to know what, what the answer is. Um, it's a complicated problem. And yet, we do know that, that there is a solution. And on the one hand, the solution is very simple. And as I said, it's complex. When it comes to the Corinthians and their division, Paul does have a solution for them. Right? He refocuses them on this core value that centers any faithful Christian community. And I think the same can be said to be true for for a lot of the world's faith traditions, right? We all, uh, many of us, share this, this same core belief, this valuing of love, right? And it's, it's a simple word. It's a word that we use all of the time, and yet it carries so many meanings in the English language. Um, I'm sometimes envious. I know that in Greek, um, at least in biblical Greek, there were like five different words for different kinds of love. We don't have that in English, and that's not the only language. Apparently Hebrew also only has one word for love. But what that means is then we do have to tease out a little bit. What are we talking about? What do we mean by love? As I said at the beginning, right, this is a passage that probably we hear it most often read at weddings. Um, and it's a beautiful passage about love, and I think certainly there are good applications for a, a marriage in this passage. When we're thinking about romantic love too, though, often we're connecting that with a particular feeling, right? A sense of affection and desire. And I think it's important to notice and to know that the love that Paul is talking about doesn't always line up with those feelings of affection and desire. Because for Paul, Christian love isn't necessarily something that we feel. It's not a warm fuzzy. It's something that we do, right? Paul wants to know, what does it mean to love someone you disagree with? What does it mean to love someone whose values differ from your own? What does it mean to love someone who annoys you? And that's why Paul takes it upon himself to spell out what Christian love looks like and what it doesn't look like, right? Love is patient, it's kind, it's not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. 
It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. It rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is what love looks like in practice when it's lived out. It's not always warm and fuzzy. And in fact, it's often sometimes the complete opposite, right? Often love in practice looks like doing things that are a huge pain for us personally, right? But these are things that we do because of our care and compassion and concern for other people. They might be a huge pain for us, but we seek to do them as best we can because we value community, because we value one another. We care about the common good. So if we think about what that looks like, well, I think love looks like caring for someone with a, a terminal or chronic condition. It looks like a parent getting out of the bed for the umpteenth time to help your kid get back to sleep. In my house, love looks like cleaning up when your cat or your dog pukes, right, or it has a mess. <laughs> Sometimes you wonder how much you love this pet, right, when they create a mess in your house. Love looks like listening and seeking to understand each other, right? Listening and not just doing all we can to make our opinion and our voice heard. Love looks like making sure all of God's children have their basic needs met for food and for housing, for safety. Even if that means that we might have to give up some of our own comfort, our own um, resources. As I was thinking for us as a congregation right now, one of the kinds of love that we're starting to live into is imagining ways of sharing our building and our land um, in ways that benefit our neighbors, even though it means loosening our claim on this space. Love is not always easy, it's often not easy, but the reason we choose to do love, the reason we show care and concern for others is because God first loved us, because this is the kind of love that we receive from God. Now there is one part in Paul's teaching that I do want to say a word about, and part of it is, I think, the, the particular translation that we use this morning, where it talks about love putting up with all things. And I think that something gets lost in translation there, or there's a danger in how we maybe interpret that. Um, the word here has more to do about bearing up against something or holding out against something, right? Paul is not endorsing um, abusive relationships. He's not saying that love is putting up with abuse or, or behavior that dehumanizes, because that is not ever love. I think it's more helpful to think about it as love being that force that does enable us to bear up against those things in life that are, are really difficult, right? And sometimes that lo love looks like bearing up in a way that we need to either um, end a relationship or step away from something for our own safety and well-being. So I just wanted to say a word about that piece. It's also important for us to know that this vision of love that Paul lays before us is not something that any of us will ever do perfectly. And it's not about needing to do this in order to, to appease or please God. Um, we do this because this is God's vision for us. We're never going to be perfect at these things. We're never going to be perfectly patient or kind or compassionate or self-giving. But as followers of Jesus and as baptized children of God, these are qualities that each day we have a chance again, to live into, to the best of our ability, right? It's not something that we say, I can't do this, right? So I'm not going to do it at all. We keep trying to live into it, knowing that we need the power of God, the power of the Spirit, because often 
And perhaps most of the time, we are not able, with our power alone, to live into this kind of love that Paul lifts up for us. So today we are blessing our community garden, our Jesus garden. And we're going to be blessing, as I said, some of the seeds that we're planting there today. And as I said at the beginning of worship, the reading that we had today doesn't talk about creation. It wouldn't lead us to think about the Jesus garden. These two things just are coming together, but I think it's really beautiful how this passage speaks into what that ministry that we're lifting up today. Because I really can't think of a more beautiful or powerful image of love for our community, how we live out the love for our community than this garden that we're blessing today. By no means does our little garden address the very real and and deepening problems of food insecurity in our community, but it is a tangible and embodied expression of the love that we want to embody all the time for our neighbors. And so it, it symbolizes that. It's a beautiful example of that love. I also, when we think of that image of seeds, I can't think of a more beautiful or powerful image of God's love for us, right? I imagine those seeds of love that God plants in each one of our hearts, seeds that the Spirit nurtures daily, seeds that we can also nurture in one another as we care and share that love. These are the seeds that do make our world a more loving place for everyone. Right? And we do our part, trusting that God can do the rest and help make those seeds sprout and grow. As we seek to share the good news of the gospel, as we seek to be witnesses for Christ in our community, we do this by planting seeds of love. Doing that literally or physically by planting those seeds in our garden, but spiritually as well through those seeds of love. May our prayer today and always be that by the power of the Spirit, that these seeds of love take root and grow and bring even just a little more love into this world that is so longing for that love. Amen. Our hymn of the day is number 644, Although I Speak with Angel's Tongue. And I will invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together.
I had meant to do this part early, earlier, but we will do it now because I would like that as we do this prayer of blessing that these seeds are being held in hands, whether you intend to take them home or not. And I don't know if we have enough for everyone, but if I could, Linda, do you mind helping? We'll maybe take some on that side. And we're just gonna distribute these so they can be prayed for. Pass one to Jordan there. Put a few down there. Here, let me give you one more here. There you go. And if you don't have a pack of the seed, um, and you're okay to move around too, there are these plants in the windows that if you wanna stand near one of those plants and raise a hand in blessing, or from where you are, raise a hand in blessing to those seeds, we'll do that too. So if you have it in your hands, um, or in your hand, I invite you to raise one or two hands in blessing as well as we pray for these seeds. And again, when we do this prayer, it's not that we believe something magical is happening to these seeds. We bless them with our words, with our hope, with our desires and our intentions, trusting that God will use them to bring nourishment and abundance um, through these seeds. So I invite you to pray with me. God, our creator, you have given us many gifts in creation and you've asked us to care for them all. We ask your blessing on these seeds as we go forth to plant this season. I invite you in this space now to offer your own silent prayer, asking God to bless these seeds and plants. As these plants take root and grow, as we care for them in our garden and in our own gardens, help us to remember to also care for those in need so that your love and goodness may grow in our hearts and in the hearts of all we meet. I invite you also now in this space to offer a silent prayer asking God to bless our neighbors and all who will eat the food we grow here. Generous God, bless our labor with rain and sunshine, that new life might spring up to your glory, providing food for the hungry, beauty for our souls, and gardens of calm in our chaotic world. We ask this through Jesus Christ, through whom all things were made. Amen. So let us pray. Creator God, in the beginning you planted a garden and filled it with animals, birds, insects, and seed-bearing plants. In the garden you first met us, your creatures. In the garden Jesus agonized over the path of suffering love. In the garden he rose to make all creation new. And so we pray for this growing place, our St. Peter's Jesus Garden. We give thanks and pray for bees, the butterflies, and all the pollinators whose labor joins with ours in producing an abundant harvest. We give thanks and pray for the Speed River, the Grand River, and all the waters of the Lake Erie watershed that sustain and nourish our crops and gardens. We give thanks and pray for all those who will labor in this garden this season. May this Jesus garden be a place not only of fertile soil, abundant food and joyful labor, but also a place of learning to tend and keep, bearing the fruit of healing and hope. Creator God, we ask you to shower down your blessings 
on this garden. And all God's people said, Amen.